Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. I make these videos every single Monday to keep you in the loop about all the latest Starship development updates, space launches we saw over the past week, and all the other interesting stories from space. I've got so much to cover once again today, from some development updates from Blue Origin's long-awaited BE4 engines, another launch failure for the seemingly cursed Chinese Hyperbola 1 rocket, but a successful flight for the massive Long March 7, and a very impressive back-to-back -back set of flights for SpaceX's Falcon 9. All this and more, so let's kick things off, beginning as always with Starship development. I gotta love talking about Starbase, it's such a beautiful skyline, right? Here's a beautiful shot of the rocket garden, ah oh yes, there's Booster 5, Ship 15, 22, and Ship 6, wait, what? Ship 20? Yep, this is the new lineup at the Rocket Garden at Starbase now. Ship 16 was moved into the Mega Bay late last week, and SpaceX hooked it up to the Mega Bay's bridge crane, the first lifting test of the crane. The nose of the booster was then removed, so there's a chance that SpaceX are now finally starting the scrap process for Ship 16. Its nose cone was then rolled out of the Mega Bay to the build site. Ship 16's place among the Rocket Garden has now been filled with Ship 20, which has now, of course, been retired from duty, so for now it looks set to be a nice lawn ornament for SpaceX, and they did a great job displaying it. The ship is standing with its flaps in the deployed position and with its heat shield facing the public roadway, so that spectators get a great view of the tiles. I still hope that, in time, we get a Saturn V style display with Booster 4 and Ship 20, though I'm not sure how easy it would be for SpaceX to mount them in this sort of horizontal configuration, if that's even possible. But it would be cool nonetheless. But yes, with Booster 4 and Ship 20 out of the picture, it's all eyes on their successors. Hopefully Ship 24 never makes it to the Rocket Garden, and instead it finally realises its destiny of becoming the first ever orbital starship before probably being destroyed. That's not to say it won't survive re-entry, but the first flight, at least as far as we're aware, is still set to see the starship re-enter the atmosphere and splash down in the Pacific Ocean. And while we have some beautiful fan animations of this happening with the rocket remaining intact, such as this clip made by the talented Seabass Productions and Neopork, Elon has stated before that both the booster and Starship won't survive the splashdown, and the ocean will be Ship 24's watery grave. Sad, but still it'll leave one heck of a legacy, not just the first orbital capable Starship, but the first payload capable Starship too. Check out this photo of the cargo bay door. We'd previously spent quite some time wondering how Starship will deploy cargo. One of my favourite concepts was this animation by Eric and Small Stars. But it looks like, for Ship 24 at least, SpaceX are taking a slightly more unconventional approach. This approach was covered in great detail in Everyday Astronaut's latest interview with Elon Musk, which came out on Saturday, and if you've not seen it, then you absolutely should. Click on the card on screen. But yes, Elon walked Tim through the high bay and showed off the Pez dispenser door and confirmed that the ship will spit out Starlink V2 satellites, much like a Pez dispenser. And while it was clear that SpaceX couldn't really divulge much into the exact technology behind this system, it was stated that the Ship 24 dispenser borrows a lot of technology from industrial pallet stackers. I doubt this release mechanism will be the same for all starships though. A large satellite or a spacecraft like the Europa Clipper probably wouldn't fit through this gap, so we'll probably see a variety of different starships for different purposes. Some dedicated Starlink V2 launchers, and some with much bigger cargo bay doors. Going by Elon's philosophy of one wanting a starship that's simple and easy to mass produce, you'd think that SpaceX would want as few variants as possible, so this is certainly going to be an interesting area of development to watch. While we're talking about the views of Ship 24 in Tim's video, we got a great view of the heat shielding of Ship 24, and it's great to see how much improvement SpaceX continued to make in the implementation of these tiles, going from Ship 20 to 22 to 24. It just looks cleaner with every iteration. Elon did make some comments about future improvements that will be made to the Starship launch vehicle. He's already stated on Twitter that the forward flaps will change a lot in upcoming versions of Starship, namely being made smaller and moved further up the leeward side of the vehicle. He also mentioned in Tim's interview that forward flaps might not even be necessary in future starships. Now, it's worth quickly noting that this video was shot a little while ago, and Ship 24 has come a long way since these shots of it were recorded. Currently, it's now fully stacked, with just the aft flaps needing to be added before it's completed. In Tim's interview, it was also stated that four grid fins, which is what the boosters currently have, just like Falcon 9, is excessive for Starship, and a long-term aspiration for SpaceX is to reduce this ideally to just two grid fins, or possibly three, with the third potentially being much smaller. 
Of course, this is similar to the original interplanetary transport system concept that SpaceX unveiled in 2016. Wait a second. First of all, SpaceX changed Starship to have six vacuum Raptors instead of three, just like the ITS, and now the booster is going to have potentially three grid fins like the ITS as well. I wonder if we'll see any other changes that'll bring Starship closer to the original ITS concept. What do you think? Are there any other concepts in this animation from SpaceX that would work well with the current Starship program? Let me know your thoughts down below. Moving on from Starships and Super Heavies, Booster 7 was installed on the launch pad last week following repairs to its crushed methane transfer tube, and SpaceX have started running new cryoproofing tests on the vehicle. We saw a total of two cryo tests in which the booster's tanks were completely filled, and hopefully these went a little bit better than the last time. It was during a cryo test that the original Booster 7 implosion happened. So far, there's no real indication that there were any issues with these tests, which is a good sign that hopefully SpaceX have fixed whatever issue caused the first implosion, and it won't happen again. Speaking of test failures though, it would seem like there is one less Raptor 2 engine in the world. This footage was captured showing a Raptor 2 fire test ending with an explosion. Now, whether or not this was completely unexpected, or if in this test SpaceX are trying to push the engine further than any Raptor 2 has ever been pushed before, and therefore this explosion was always going to be a possibility, well, I guess we'll never know. Hopefully this isn't representative of any major setback for Raptor. Starship Gazer caught this photo of workers beginning the installation of the first wall section of the new Starship factory building. Expect to see this structure rapidly begin to take shape over the next few weeks. SpaceX made quite a remarkable achievement last week. They made back-to-back -back Falcon 9 flights within the same 24-hour period. These were Starlink missions Group 413 and Group 415, the former launching from the Vandenberg launch site in California, with the latter launching on the other side of the country in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Both boosters completed their respective launches and landings, and you may notice that the booster used for the Group 415 launch looks a lot less sooty and more white and shiny than what we're used to seeing. And that's because this was a brand new Falcon 9 booster, although the fairings used on this mission have both been flown before. Still, it's cool to see a brand new booster taking flight, and in fact, this is the very first time that SpaceX have used a new Falcon 9 booster for an active Starlink mission. They've previously only used flight-proven boosters. This was the 20th orbital launch from SpaceX for 2022, which puts them one step closer to achieving their target of 60 launches in total. A couple of weeks ago, United Launch Alliance boss Tori Bruno tweeted that Blue Origin are finally getting close to at long last finishing the first flight-ready BE-4 engines for ULA's Vulcan Centaur rocket. Since then, Tori shared this shot of the sleek paint job for Vulcan. But a pretty rocket isn't great if there are no engines to power it. Until last week, the only real update we had was this photo here, which is just the combustion chamber and nozzle sections of the engines, albeit with a seemingly more complete looking engine in the background. Well, last week we had some amazing footage shared by Blue Origin. Shame that this was on Twitter, which has terrible video quality, but it's still cool nonetheless. This test shows the engines achieving 8 degrees of gimbal during a hot fire test operating at 100% power level. I can't wait to see Vulcan take flight with these things. Hopefully Vulcan is a bit more successful than the Chinese Hyperbola 1 rocket. This is a 21 meter tall rocket that first launched in July 2019, successfully reaching low Earth orbit. However, the subsequent two launches in February and August of 2021 both resulted in failure. Last week, the rocket's manufacturer, iSpace, made another launch attempt of the Hyperbola 1, but once again, the flight unfortunately ended in failure. There is no known available footage of the flight, by the way, so the footage on screen is a previous Hyperbola 1 launch. The exact time of liftoff and subsequent failure is unclear, but loss of the payload has been confirmed by official state sources. Hopefully, iSpace can figure out their issues with Hyperbola 1, and we won't see a fourth consecutive launch failure from them. China did manage a successful Long March 7 launch last week, though. This was the third cargo resupply mission to the Chinese Tiangong space station, which is currently under construction in low Earth orbit. About seven hours after the launch, the Tianzhou 4 cargo spacecraft successfully docked with the station. This spacecraft will not only provide propellant for the station to maintain its orbit, but it'll also contain all the supplies for the next astronauts who are currently scheduled to arrive at the station in June for the Shenzhou 14 mission. Last Monday, I covered Rocket Lab's successful recovery of their latest Electron First Stage booster. 
I'm bringing this back up again briefly just to answer a few of your questions that you had, as I think they're definitely worth answering. One major query that some people raised was, why are Rocket Lab catching the rocket out of the air, instead of landing it under its own power at the landing site or in an ocean barge, like SpaceX do with their Falcon 9, and how Blue Origin keeps saying they're going to land New Glenn when it's done, eventually. And in fact, Rocket Lab's Neutron rocket, which is still very early in development, mind, is also planned to land vertically. So why use a helicopter catch for Electron? Plain and simple, Uglen, Falcon 9 and Neutron are medium and heavy lift launch vehicles, and are many times more massive than Electron. Take a look at some humans for scale by a Falcon 9. This rocket is huge. Now compare that to Electron, which is a comparatively tiny vehicle. In fact, when empty, it only weighs one ton, versus the 25 tons of an empty Falcon 9. No helicopter can really lift a Falcon 9, so the Falcon has to set aside fuel in order to land itself. And in fact, the fuel needed for a Falcon landing almost certainly weighs less than the mass of the hypothetical parachute required to decelerate such a huge rocket. Electron is super small though, and it doesn't really have the payload capacity to allow it to carry enough fuel to propulsively land. That, and of course, propulsively landing means it needs landing legs, steering fins, etc, etc, and of course the development of complicated software and the landing platform itself. The helicopter method is much cheaper and of course a lot more simple. Oh, and as for why Rocket Lab don't just let it land in the ocean and fish it out later, salt water is really really bad for rocket parts, and the impact of splashdown is much more significant on the rocket compared with the helicopter cache, especially considering that it's the engines that bear the brunt of a water impact. I want to go on a quick history tangent by the way. Did you know that in the early days of spy satellites tech, imaging satellites couldn't transmit their pictures back to Earth? Instead, they would eject their film canisters, which would then re-enter the atmosphere and be snagged out of the air by a C-130 aircraft. While I was writing my little answer about the Rocket Lab helicopter catches, I was just reminded of this little tidbit, so I thought you might find that interesting as well. What I certainly do hope you find interesting is the thought of joining my Patreon and channel membership programs, just like the lovely folk on screen did. By signing up you get early access to videos, and I try to share behind the scenes content when I can. Hit up the links in the description or via the Patreon button on screen if you want to check it out, I always do appreciate the support. Otherwise, check out the two video suggestions on screen. The YouTube robots think you'll like them, so hopefully you will. Thanks for flying with me today, and I'll see you all next time.